Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the last day of the Amputee Coalition's Virtual Advocacy Forum. This forum has been a wonderful way to celebrate limb loss and limb difference awareness month together. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time today, my name is Carol Blymeyer, and I'll be your host through all of our conversations this morning. Before we get started, let me just remind everyone these sessions are being recorded and they'll be available on the Amputee Coalition's website. And the conversations that you all are having in the chat function are also being archived. So we encourage you to treat that like you would any social media platform. Throughout this session, I'll be here to facilitate your participation. So if you have any questions for the presenters at any point today, you can type it into the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. And we'll do our very best to answer as many questions as possible as we can through the session. You'll also find some helpful resources from the Amputee Coalition under the handouts tab on the right side of your screen next to the chat and the polling functions, some background about our speakers, some helpful information and a glossary of terms about some of the government and policy terms you'll be hearing today, and an infographic about the federal funding process. So I'd like to introduce the other people who will be joining us today in our conversation. From the Amputee Coalition, we have Mary Richards. She is the coalition's president and CEO. With her is Dan Ignazewski, and Dan is the Amputee Coalition's Chief Policy and Programs Officer. If you want to learn more about our speaker's experience, their bios are in the handout section in the right side of your screen, or it's also available on the Amputee Coalition website. To get us started, I'd like to hand it over to Dan to give us some stats and background about our community. Dan, it's all yours. Awesome. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, we, uh, you know, we, we often include the, this infographic that's available in your handouts as, as something that's helpful for people to understand the makeup of the community. And it's something that, um, you know, it's an opportunity to be able to dispel myths and also help people understand, um, you know, what we, what, what we represent, um, and as a community and, uh, and how we can get involved and in how, um, how valuable the programs and services are that support the community to help people uh, in their recovery and their readjustment. Um, you know, there's about 2 million Americans living with limb loss uh, and limb difference. And, you know, the vast majority of them are actually due to vascular disease and diabetes, um, complications in some of those spaces. And, you know, while there's a general misconception out there, oftentimes, um, from from folks in the the broader population that it's due to um, active conflicts in Afghanistan or Iraq or other um, other military conflicts, the truth is it's actually a relatively small subset of the population. Uh, there's only about uh, you know 1,500 to 2,000 uh, military personnel who have lost a limb in the last uh, last in in the active uh, conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, you know, the majority of people are everyday Americans that are going about their lives and, and living, um, you know, different experiences. Um, we have a, a number of people that are uh, experience trauma and experience uh, loss due to cancers or uh, sepsis or other um, complicating disease factors. And so we want to make sure that people understand that the limb loss and limb difference community is vast. It's very, very disparate. And there's a lot of different causes and needs across the population. And that's where the uh, Amputee Coalition's National Limb Loss Resource Center is really trying to support uh, everybody across the community, all ages, all uh, backgrounds, and, and all causes of limb loss and, and limb difference. Um, and so those are some of the things that we try to do. We try to dispel those myths uh, of, of you know, what those causes are and, and what the makeup of the community is. Um, and we really try to make sure that that we're representing the community and we're providing the resources across all of those different causes and challenges uh, that different community members face. Um, so that's what we try to do uh, through the National Limb Loss Resource Center at the Amputee Coalition. Uh, and we also try to make sure that um, that people are, are using this information to help us, you know, communicate this to the broader population and to, to policymakers um, and others so that people understand what the community really is like. Um, and so that's really, really useful uh, fact sheet. Um, 
people, please, uh, you know, please take a chance to, to check that out in the handout section um, and use that as we're, we're talking through the different engagement opportunities um, that we're going to be talking about later today. Uh, and with that, I think I'll hand it back to Carol to move on to the next section. Thank you, Dan. That's really helpful information because when we are talking about our community and we use the phrase our community, it helps to have a sense of what that actually means and especially addressing some of the misconceptions that people have about people with limb loss and limb difference. And this sets the stage really well for our guest speaker today. And I will turn it over to Mary Richards, the Amputee Coalition President and CEO to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, thank you, Carol. I appreciate that. I know the community is very interested to learn more about how the federal government is responding to COVID-19 and to hear more about how the Department of Health and Human Services is meeting the needs of Americans living with limb loss and limb difference and what those things mean for our community. In particular, we'll learn more about how we can work with Department of Health and Human Services, also known as HHS, we love an acronym in Washington, DC, uh, to improve access to care and services. We not only are constituents of the Department of Health and Human Services, but we are here to be help uh, and experts who provide feedback and inputs so that HHS knows how people living with um, limb loss and limb difference and all Americans are living well um, and how we can live uh, in ways that allow us to either return to work, uh, return to family and return to community. So we get to also start off this meeting with Laura this morning by saying thank you because the president's budget for next year included funding for the National Limb Loss Resource Center. We very much appreciate that and it is my privilege to welcome to the Amputee Coalition's first ever virtual advocacy forum, Laura Truman. Laura as, serves as the director of the Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs at HHS. Previously, she served as senior policy advisor to the House Majority Whip, as legislative director for a U.S. Senator, and she's worked at the Heritage Foundation, United Health, and the Coalition for Affordable Health Coverage. We're always excited to engage directly with policymakers, and we're looking forward to a substantive conversation about policy, not politics. We're honored that Laura is able to join us today, especially under these unusual circumstances, and especially during Limb Loss Awareness Month. Thank you so much, Laura, for being with us and welcome Laura Truman. Great, thank you so much, Mary. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's an honor to join you all, even in this unusual way. Uh, it's a little disconcerting to not see audience uh, faces and response and head nodding. So I'm going to pretend I'm seeing that. Um, thank you very much for including HHS in today's conversation. Uh, I know that um, there are a number of divisions in HHS uh, that work directly with you all uh, in various programs. Um, certainly the National Limb Loss Center is an important piece of that, but also Medicare, Medicaid, um, even our work with um, FDA. So there's a lot of ways your members intersect with HHS uh, and so I'm happy to talk to you. Um, so my work is doing um, outreach with uh, the external facing world. And so uh, we have the intergovernmental side, which is, you know, governors, state legislators, mayors. And right now that is a particularly busy side because as you can imagine, um, governors are very, very concerned about what they're uh, dealing with in their communities with uh, COVID-19. There is uh, constant engagement, both uh, as governors uh, writ large, there's a weekly call um, that the president and the vice president, Secretary Azar and other members of the cabinet do with governors. And then there is an enormous amount of um, outreach that my staff does one-on-one -on -one with governor's offices about specific issues, whether it's testing or personal protective equipment. So that's one side of our shop. Um, 
the another side is the external affairs, external audiences. So that's what you all would be, the non-governmental, but people who are impacted by our programs. So that might be doctors, nurses, hospitals, uh, pharmaceutical companies, patient groups. And so it's our job to make sure that there is a uh, two-way communication, not just one way, two-way communication with um, the people whose lives uh, our programs touch. And so uh, certainly today, that's why I uh, wanted to join you. And in addition, we have um, our tribal uh, uh, team that works with tribal governments and, and facilitates that government to government relationship. And then we have a center that does um, outreach to the faith-based community and to community organizations like say YMCA and others that are providing services in their communities. So we try to, to um, be have doors open to uh, everyone who needs to navigate HHS. There are uh, about 77,000 people that work at HHS, so it can be hard to know what door is the right door to come in to have those conversations, and that's what we're here to do. All that to say that makes me a, um, a big picture person and not an expert. So uh, what I'd like to do is share a little bit about our big picture, and, uh, and then we can further refine. Um, so I have been at HHS since January of 2017 when President Trump uh, was inaugurated and it has been quite an amazing uh, journey. Nothing compares with um, trying to come into an agency this size and get your arms around what is going and then try to implement the president's policies. Um, but uh, the most unique journey I would say is right now because uh, nobody in this country uh, has lived through anything quite like this, uh, both uh, government side and private sector. So I have felt enormously proud to be a part of an agency that has such enormous expertise to bring to bear. Whether it's uh, Anthony Fauci, Dr. Fauci at the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Redfield and all the people at CDC who track uh, um, disease outbreaks, our um, Assistant Secretary for Health, Dr. Jawa, who's spent his entire life as a physician and uh, working uh, in uh, areas that are informing what he does and says. So I uh, have been very proud to be a part of uh, the work that we're doing in this. But I'd like to step back and talk to you a little bit about uh, our, our goals drilled down to COVID-19, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit about our big picture goals. So, you know, when we came in uh, to office, there was an enormous interest in health care reform. Um, while the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, worked for some people, for other people, it was actually problematic. Um, the premiums for the Affordable Care Act had gone up uh, drastically and uh, the very people they were designed to help um, were finding them less and less affordable, uh, particularly if they did not qualify for the subsidies. So we sort of stepped into a storm of this was meant to solve a problem, yet it is um, in some ways exacerbating a problem. Uh, other ways it was meeting a need. So um, initially, you know, the goal was uh, broader health care reform. But that requires two to tango. It requires uh, certainly a president and an administration that uh, has ideas and a plan, but it also requires a congressional action. And if you recall, um, we did not have uh, uh, legislation that passed. Um, uh, on Capitol Hill to make those larger changes. So what that did is make us ask, okay, how can we within our realm of um, jurisdiction, the things that we can change, how can we make things better for people? How can we address those cost issues? And so one of the uh, goals for this administration 
is a lot of flexibility and patient choice. So where we can, we have tried to facilitate that. So for example, um, with the Affordable Care Act, um, there are waivers that uh, have been created and flexibilities that have been created to allow uh, a broader range of policies for people to choose from. So, uh, and then we've supplemented that with other um, things where, um, like for example, if someone uh, loses their job, which we know uh, many, many people are doing right now, they may go uh, because they lost their job to um, the Affordable Care Act site and find out I do not, I can't afford anything that's on there. They have a new option now, which is uh, referred to as short-term limited duration health insurance. And it is meant to tide people over. It doesn't have the same requirements of um, all the same coverage services, but there are protections. Every state has a insurance commission that makes sure that there are not um, abusive policies that you know, promise one thing and don't deliver. Um, but not everybody needs in vitro fertilization or not everyone needs um, uh, alcohol and drug rehab. Um, so some of the things um, that are on the essential health benefits that drive up the cost of those plans, there's greater flexibility. So one thing was giving greater flexibility and choice to people. The other thing is, um, what I would say is uh, the uh, delivering value piece. So most of our system is built around if you bill, we pay for an individual service. And I know many of you have probably intersected pretty heavily with the um, uh, healthcare world in the process of uh, managing limb loss or limb difference. and. Uh, one of the things that individual payment for individual services can do is create a situation where, you know, you have to, you don't have great coordination among all the providers that are taking care of you um, because they don't really need to. They do their little piece and then they go on to their next patient. So one of the things that we have tried to uh, Band is something called value-based care. And this is the idea that um, we know what kind of outcome uh, a patient needs for a particular diagnosis. We know what constitutes success for that patient. And instead of paying all the different providers that um, serve that patient individually, we're going to pay one large fee that providers work together to address and get uh, the best outcome so that they can get the most man, uh, for that fee. So closed healthcare systems like, um, for example, the Mayo Clinic, we all know that they do a fantastic job. They do this naturally because their physicians are on staff and so they collaborate together. I, I had a friend that recently went there for a very serious illness and was blown away by a very strong team-based approach. We are trying to create conditions where that happens more often. Oops, sorry. So, um, we also are trying to do discrete changes with low hanging fruit. So um, one of the things is, uh, for example, there are just dumb things that are in place sometimes in the federal government. For example, if somebody calls an ambulance and that ambulance comes out and they assess the person uh, and they assess that that person really doesn't need hospital care they could be taken care of at an urgent care clinic. You know, maybe they have a simple infection. That ambulance would only be paid if they take them to the hospital. That's a, a Medicare rule. So you can see it incentivize the highest form, the most expensive form of care, 
when that was not necessarily the most appropriate. So, you know, we took some steps to try to change that so that uh, a common sense match the need of the patient with the right setting. Um, another situation has been with uh, kidney care. Uh, millions of people um, have uh, are on dialysis or on transplant wait lists. And our system had been set up that patients had to go every day to a dialysis center in order to have payment for their services. And it did not cover or covered in a very minimal way at home dialysis. Well, you can imagine how disruptive it is to go every day for a number of hours to a dialysis center. Patients wanted the choice to be able to have in-home dialysis, an in-home dialysis machine, uh, and to do that. So that's a change that we are making uh, to allow patients to uh, receive that care at home. And I know you all have the ability to chat and uh, there's two things that I'm hoping for feedback on. And this made me think of it and I wanted to tell you ahead of time, even before I get to those areas. One is uh, I'd really like your feedback on telehealth. So, you know, in-home dialysis is not the same as telehealth, but it made me think of it. Both with COVID-19 uh, uh, and in general, you know, we want to promote um, a variety of ways of getting care. And some of you may be for the first time using some telehealth capabilities now or have in the past. Uh, for feedback, I'd be very interested to learn how that's worked for you, what barriers you have found. Uh, I know broadband has uh, uh, is a barrier for some. Um, so I would like to hear a little bit on that. And the other topic that I want to cover is uh, our work in the opioid uh, space and in addressing addiction. Certainly uh, your community uh, has had exposure to uh, needing pain relief and pain management. And um, so I'd be interested in feedback about your observations, either your own experience or those you've talked to about um, are providers changing how they are managing uh, pain? Are they offering um, more choices? Are they more cognizant of the keen addictive nature of um, the uh, opioid? And uh, are they also careful so that people who really need an opioid can still get it? So those are some things I would love to have your feedback on. I know we can't have uh, lots of questions on those today, but even afterwards, your hosts have informed me that you, they will be able to share some of that. So it can't be two-way today like it would be in person, but I'd be very interested in that. So if we could go to the slide about um, another area of our work, which is lowering the price of um, prescription drugs. Uh, this certainly would be an area that uh, you may have encountered, and it has been an area of great concern to the president, uh, certainly to our senior citizens, and um, for anybody who is moving towards a high deductible health plan and has to pay out of pocket and uh, for that initial deductible and actually then encounters the price of um, prescription drugs. So this has been a presidential priority and um, we are very proud of the work that we've done on this so far. Uh, one of the things is that every day uh, or every year that we've been in office, the number of generic drugs that have been approved by the Food and Drug Administration has uh, increased year over year, setting records. And any of you who have gone from a brand name to a generic drug know what a huge difference that can make in the cost of your medications. So that gets to speed and efficiency and um, ensuring that we get those alternatives out. So that's certainly one thing. Um, in addition, uh, there's been a long push for importation um, of some sort. And by importation, you know, people recognize that 
whether it's Canada or Europe, many countries pay far, far, far less than we do here in the United States for the same drugs. And um, we have been looking for a way to address that. Uh, we do not want to upend um, our drug approval process. Um, we do not want to take full time, uh, full control over drug management. I, I'm popular at this hour, excuse me. Um, so uh, what we want to do is find some ways to create other options. So uh, what we've done is put forward for the first time ever, the FDA has put forward a path that states can choose, which would be um, how to uh, import drugs from Canada so that people in their state could possibly buy their medications from that source or sources uh, in their state. Uh, it's not happened yet. Uh, we've put forward the plan. States had time to comment on it because this is going to be breaking new ground. We are reviewing those comments and then we will finalize, you know, here's the path for states to go to want to do this. So we, you know, competition is a really important thing. And um, even allowing that kind of a new avenue for people to purchase medication certainly sends a message to drug manufacturers about their prices and puts downward pressure on them. And we think that's a good thing. Um, I'd also like to uh, highlight that we certainly have made changes in uh, making the drug approval process faster. Uh, you know, what you are seeing in COVID-19 uh, is remarkable. Uh, the number of tests that have been approved in record time, the number of uh, treatments that are already in clinical trials. So that has been a high priority um, and something that we have done uh, a lot of work on. Uh, next, I would like to talk to you a little bit about um, the drug overdose crisis to many, 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 and one of the things that struck him personally were the people who came up and told their stories about family members who had lost based on overdoses. We were dealing with something that for the first time was driving down life expectancy in our country for Americans. That is how prevalent it was. And it, it was, um, it was a number of factors that led us to that place. It was not going to be an easy fix. And we didn't take, you know, we didn't expect any magic bullet. But we did a whole slew of things, which the most remarkable of which is the, um, you know, when we came in, I guess you can see it, the trajectory on um, overdose deaths had been a steep upward slope. In the last year or two, it leveled off and it has actually started a decline. And, you know, again, I'm very proud to be a part of an administration that, that is not just talk uh, or talk with solutions that don't work. What we have seen uh, is that the things that we've put in place and, and you know, it would be wrong to say we as in only the federal government because um, the, uh, we- Are you going to marry Grigal? Um, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. Excuse me. Um, it would be wrong to say that we have um, done it by ourselves because the true help here is uh, in communities that have come together and work uh, together to address this in their communities. So um, some of the things that we have done is uh, increase, uh, encourage states uh, to uh, take action to make sure that providers are educated, you know, in their uh, educational programs about the addictive nature of opioids. We have in our federal programs like Medicare said you can only get a certain number of uh, medications uh, but 
our secretaries, uh, Secretary Tom Price and now Secretary Azar, personally experienced going to the dentist and uh, getting, you know, a 30-day prescription for an opioid, which they didn't need. And uh, so we now, you know, there are such things as, as three-day or five-day prescriptions. So addressing that, getting the naloxone out into the community so that there is a uh, ability to um, uh, bring someone back who has overdosed and give them, you know, more time to understand they need to go into treatment. And then lastly, you know, we have put uh, more than $4 billion into ramping up treatment programs because that is, that is the, the thing that needs to happen. People really can't do this on their own. They really need help in 99.9% .9 of the uh, situations and they need evidence-based treatment. Uh, and that's what we have, uh, helped states find and support in their states. So those are things that I think uh, are some of the high points of our work. Uh, and I think at this point, I'm happy to um, take any questions or comments you're getting from the chat room. Much, Laura. We do have a lot of questions coming in, uh, and we're also running tight on time. So let me. Add, there, there are two questions. There are a lot of questions that are kind of centered around two topics. The first one is around mental health and COVID nineteen, and we can only imagine how busy you are with the pandemic crisis and response that the federal government yeah. uh, is working through. What advice do you have for people in the limb loss and limb difference community in terms of how they can cope with mental health and social isolation when it comes to pandemic uh, stay-at-home provisions. Absolutely. I think everybody uh, is experiencing um, how different it is to be uh, homebound um, and uh, resources both on the uh, um, ACL site that I think are specifically uh, dedicated toward um, your community, but also on the um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services uh, Administration, SAMHSA. They have uh, a rich uh, variety of uh, resources. And you know, for all of us, it is very, it's also um, steps to make sure that when you notice that you are feeling sort of isolated or lost or not connected, um, it's time to make those phone calls. Uh, you know, we, we really do need to take steps that normally we wouldn't take, uh, calling people. Um, and if you're feeling it, then that chances are that the people that are in your circle are also feeling it. So uh, I'm very conscious uh, of my family. You know, I have at least uh, four family members who live by themselves and so you have people, you know, that live by themselves. And so doing that outreach and being proactive, uh, I think, uh, is, is critical. And also knowing when you're getting to the point where you really need help, um, where uh, it feels way too black and dark. Uh, and then that is when you need to call your, your helplines and uh, we will make sure that you have those both for your community. I think that communities often have strong resources in this area, but also the national one, which if you call that, then they have um, local resources. So those are some things I would say. And if Great. just jump in for one second, I'll just remind people that, that as, as um, Director Truman just said, there are resources out there for you. Um, we are working with our support group leaders to make sure that where we are accustomed to engaging with each other, that we've got alternative ways of virtual engagement, telephonic engagement, so that we're staying in touch with each other. I know we have some tremendous leaders that I have heard from who are uh, making individual calls and doing online meetings, and they are... Um, you know, just touching base almost in those old school phone tree types of ways. Um, so we'll take fancy technology and then we'll take just the ways that we've done this since uh, I played soccer in the 1980s. And, you know, we'll do what we can yes. to stay in touch with each other. The last yes. thing I'll mention is 
those hotlines and those resources that are available through the federal government are very useful. And if you need to be connected to well-being services through the Amputee Coalition, call our toll-free number, 888-267-5669. It's on, I think, every single page of our website, uh, so you can find it there. But our um, Limb Loss Resource Center staff are trained in how to help you and direct you. Uh, but lastly, um, as Director Truman just said, if you're in a space where you need immediate help, please, we'll provide you with some of those numbers. Um, stay safe. It's really important. Be engaged as you can, but stay safe. If you're in a place where you need immediate help, please, please, let's get that for you. Absolutely. Let me move on to another question. Um, we, on this, uh, in this forum, we've got a few hundred advocates who are used to reaching out to members of Congress around appropriations issues and other legislative issues. But can you share with us what some of the best ways are for advocates to reach out to HHS to ask about ways to improve access to care for people living with limb loss and limb difference? Yes, absolutely. Um, so it is very good to be part of organizations. Um, that represent patient groups because when, you know, I one of my jobs is to organize roundtables for the secretary. So, for example, if you take uh, the opioid epidemic, whether it was when we went to communities or here in Washington, you know, it would be my job to find patients, come in and talk about their experience. Uh, uh, and so how do I do that? don't know you to call you, so I call organizations to say, could you find uh, patients that uh, would represent uh, someone who is in this X situation? So uh, I know some of you have dealt with um, diabetes and are part of the limb loss community from that. Uh, you know, so you're in, but you might also want to be uh, a part of the uh, American Diabetes Association. One thing. Um, the second thing is uh, when it comes to members of Congress, you know, uh, uh, well, you, you asked about uh, talking to HHS. Our, our office is the front door, um, and so we do absolutely uh, welcome outreach and uh, look for uh, ways to help people. Um, in addition, we have regional offices. So if you're looking for somebody a little closer to you, um, there are 10 regional offices that HHS has. In those regional offices, there are people that represent the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. There are people that represent um, ACL. There are people that represent um, our office. Uh, we have a director of um, our government, a, a regional director in every office. Uh, and so that's another place that I would uh, uh, send you uh, for outreach and relaying your concerns, especially if it's more local related, uh, then they can, they're more keen, be aware of what's going on in communities and can respond. If it's policy related, it's probably uh, going through us. Great. Um, would you also be able to talk a little bit more about how HHS thinks about access to care issues and how they're working to expand access to care for patients. Sure. Um, well, the most immediate crisis for us is um, what the COVID-19 has done with healthcare providers. So when you tell hospitals and doctors, stop your elective procedures and uh, ramp up in case you get uh, hit with COVID-19 patients, that is a drastic change for them in terms of revenue. And the most important thing uh, is that for your members or people who might get COVID-19, that we have an in-place um, healthcare system. So for example, rural hospitals that were already um, very um, uh, precarious, uh, this would be enough to take a number of them down. So. One of the things is that Congress um, passed 
a $100 billion provider relief fund. Uh, and now just recently, they've added another $75 billion. One of the things we're doing is getting that money out to hospitals and doctors and labs and durable medical equipment, anybody who is a provider, and that's writ large, um, to help uh, them stay afloat right now because we would all be com in compromised circumstances in terms of access if, if they don't, um, if their businesses go under. So that's the most immediate thing that we're doing. In terms of access to care, you know, I think that is a, a lot of what we're doing with telemedicine. Uh, we also have really encouraged states um, to uh, think through their scope of practice laws. Uh, you know, there is a dynamic at the state level. Um, doctors don't want nurse practitioners or physician assistants to be able to do um, as many things as perhaps they're licensed to do. And uh, yet out in rural areas, sometimes uh, a rural area would be thrilled if they got a dental hygienist to come out there and clean teeth you know, twice a month uh, rather than nothing at all. So um, one of the things we're trying to do is encourage states to ensure that um, they allow providers to do as much as they can to meet those needs. I think those are the two I think of right off the top of my head. Great. Yeah, and those, and those telehealth services have been really helpful in a lot of ways, I think. Um, you know, we've worked with a lot of physical therapists and occupational therapists, um, you know, wound care doctors who a lot of wound care clinics are closing now and, and you know, elective surgeries for amputation even. Um, have, have been delayed uh, in many cases. And so, um, you know, those telehealth visits in terms of how to care for your wounds, how to continue physical therapy and occupational activities, um, those are definitely uh, really valuable, I think, for a lot of folks in the community right now. So, Well, and yeah. that leads into, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, we, um, there are, uh, we are working, you know, before this kind of took over, <laughs> we have been working a lot on the Rural Health Challenge. And um, there are some really good uh, models out there that should be scaled up. One uh, we refer to as the hub and spoke model, you know, where, for example, in South Dakota, um, Sioux Falls has some really great medical facilities. And they are partnering with, they're the hub, and then they partner and uh, work with like a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant or even an RN out in the rural areas um, to connect people through telehealth uh, with the care they need. So there's things that we will be uh, rolling out more um, opportunities on. Uh, and I would just mention lastly, Carol, before we go to the next uh, question, a lot of folks in our community receive care through the Veterans Administration clinics and the hub and spokes model that they have deployed across centers of excellence, including some of ours, have been really productive for our community members. So it's heartening to hear that we're taking those lessons learned and extending them into communities that really do need um, creative solutions to access to high quality care. That's great to hear. Yes. Yeah. You know, the best thing, we're doing this with the opioid epidemic and with the rural health challenge, is to find communities that have, have really made some things work well and then scale those up. And uh, that is the exact approach that uh, we are working on. Great. I have one last quick question. Uh, COVID-19, as Dan mentioned, means that a lot of surgical centers are closed and a lot of rehab facilities are closed. Once this virus and is under control or some of the stay-at-home guidelines are loosened, what is HHS doing to get those needed services back up to speed as quickly as possible? Are you issuing separate guidances about that? Yes. So um, I, I anticipate that there will be pent-up demand, right? People have put things off that uh, they will be very anxious uh, have um, addressed. And so um, 
one of the most important pieces is the orderly reopening of America. Um, and so, you know, there, there's a lot of fear about doing it too quickly. And um, so there are going to be guidances um, already. You know, there's the big guidelines for reopening America that the president put forward. And uh, that has some very concrete markers about when we're ready to go to phase one. And what does phase one look like in a community? Phase two, phase three. And um, so to the extent that we can restore the ability to go in for um, medical care, I think like many other things, it will be um, with some parameters. You won't have six people in a waiting room, you know, waiting for uh, a doctor. Uh, there will be staggered appointments. Uh, you will not have um, the same kind of situation where uh, I would imagine they will keep telehealth very broadly open so that even when trying to meet, like, you know, I, I had a friend whose father did rehab and they did it by telehealth, which I never would have figured out. I thought you had to be there with a person showing you how to do things, but they, they managed it. So there will be uh, ways that uh, we phase in reopening. Um, and I would imagine there will be uh, a backlog. And, and I think really it'll be up to communities and um, hospitals and physician groups to figure out how to triage that. I think that would not be a good federal role um, for us. But um, yeah, I hope that great. That's it. very, that's very, very helpful. Those were some great questions. We've got uh, a, a lot more that are in the queue that we will work with uh, HHS to get you all answers on the folks who are out there in our forum land. Um, Mary, can I ask you to wrap it up before we go to break? Happy to. And thank you, Carol. Uh, we know that Director Truman coordinates with governors and others, as well as hospitals, physicians, patient groups like ours, um, and that right now is an unusually busy time. And so we are truly grateful for her focus and attention today to share with us um, how HHS is looking broadly at the needs of Americans with health conditions and service needs. Um, we especially appreciate her focus and time during this time of extraordinary needs. Um, and we always appreciate the opportunity to speak directly with and engage with policymakers, including uh, Dr. Truman, so um, Director Truman. So just thank you so much, Laura Truman, for being with us today, for spending some precious hours, um, a precious hour with us. I know that your schedule um, is incredibly busy and we wish you luck as you're trying to take care of the needs of Americans during this um, challenging and extraordinary time. And you know, Mary, I would like to say thank you to your members. And I think your members have something very important to contribute right now. Uh, all of you, by virtue of uh, you know, being an organization, have dealt with some uh, tough times, have dealt with health challenges, have dealt with um, being different, feeling different. And uh, that kind of uh, grit that you develop uh, by managing that. Uh, everybody needs to, to, people can draw from that from you now. And so I would just say you have something important to contribute because um, it takes a lot of strength to uh, manage and uh, survive and to flourish. In, and you've done amazing work. And I would just say, there's a, even a bigger reason for you all to reach out and make sure you're connecting with others. Thank you so much. And um, I've only been a part of this community for about nine months now. And I can tell you that my experience being president and CEO of this organization is true to exactly um, those sentiments. And I think um, I'm so proud to work with this community that has resilience and agility 
and the ability to adapt. And uh, we will be taking that expertise and sharing it with policymakers um, in the administration and in Congress, and also with our other community members back at home. So thank you very much for your time. Um, Carol, may I hand it back to you to help us um, organize ourselves before we take a quick break? Yes, we are going to take a 10 minute break now and we'll reconvene about a few minutes after 12 noon Eastern time. Um, just like we've done before on previous breaks, you're going to see some poll questions pop up on your screen. So go ahead and answer those so we can learn best how we can serve you. Uh, take a break, grab a beverage, uh, stretch a little bit, and we'll see you a few minutes after 12 o'clock noon Eastern time. Like, thanks again for being with us. We'll see you in a few.